welcome to St. Andrew's Episcopal Church. My name is Barbara and I am so happy to serve here as the rector and the priest and I welcome you on behalf of our whole parish community. We are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us. This will be a time of holiness, of engagement through music and sacred story and through prayer. We invite you to come on in and become a part of this holy experience with God. We invite you into a moment of silence to begin our worship. Answer the call to worship. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask, and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness, and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not ask, and for our blindness we cannot. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now, praying together, O oh God, you have bound us together in a common life. Help us in the midst of our struggles for justice and truth in our nation, to support one another without hatred or bitterness. That being bonded in love, we may live in unity with you and one another, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you. 
A reading from the book of Genesis. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, and to the north and to the south, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid, and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called the place Bethel. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. A reading from Psalm 139, verses 1 through 11 and 22 and 23. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O Lord, know it all together. You press upon me behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. Where can I go then from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I climb up to heaven, you are there. If I make the grave my bed, you are there also. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me, and the light around me turn to night. Darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light to you are both alike. Search me out, O God, and know my heart. Try me, and know my restless thoughts. Look well whether there be any wickedness in me, and lead me in the way that is everlasting. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself 
will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus put before the crowd another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, the enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came out and bore bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. The slaves of the householders came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, Not for in gathering the weeds would you uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went to the house. 
and his disciples approached him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one and the enemy who sowed them in it is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all the evil doers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. Let anyone with ears listen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Good morning. As we begin our conversation this morning, I want to invite you to ponder a photograph with me. And as we spend a few moments with it, I invite you to allow words to come to your heart that you would use to describe the image that you will see. What are the emotions that you see? What are the characteristics of this amazing woman that have been revealed in this photograph? And then what is the essence of God? What is God's reality that you see? in her eyes or her heart or her stance. So let's look at this together for just a moment. This image, of course, is of Joan Applegate, a beloved friend of so many of us and whose life we celebrated last year and whose presence still clings to our very soul of our parish in so very many ways, and particularly in the beautiful music that is created from her piano. When we look at this photograph, what is unique about it and what is why it, I think, has been resonating on my heart all week long is that it's actually unusual. We so rarely take photographs of those loved ones as they near death. And this photograph was taken maybe just a few days before she died. Joan had moved into one of the facilities at Menno Haven. And after we got her settled, and she was sitting there, one of her children snapped this photograph and caught the essence, I think, of Joan. Because in, when I look at that, I see her strength and I see her courage and I see her beauty and I see her love. All of that revealed in that stance as she looked over, as one of her children said at her service, as she looked at the sun setting, both literally and figuratively on her life. And she could see in her view Wilson College that had been such a big part of her life and could imagine the place where her husband had died. We are blessed by this photograph and blessed that we have before us an example of how images that we can capture can actually reveal more than what we see, that they can be lenses into the holy that can be within our own hearts and souls and can be revealed in our life. I think very often the photographs that we take are certainly true to us and they can mark the milestones in our lives and they can help us project the image and maybe it is our reality that we are successful per the world's standards. And we certainly saw those wonderful and marvelous photographs at Joan's memorial service of the joy of her wedding day and the gift of her children and her grandchildren. And I have boxes full of photographs of my young boys filled with these milestone moments 
moments when they're all dressed up in their beautiful outfits or when Andrew's heading off at four for his first piano recital or, you know, Philip is there with his swimming medals. I mean, we have all of those when everything looks wonderful and successful and all is well. And I treasure every single one of them. But the ones that grab my heart are the ones that speak. They're the spontaneous ones, the ones that speak of the real essence of my children. Their silly faces that they would make or their 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 interactions with their grandpa or with Diana, their cousin. You know, the, the ones that really capture who they were in that moment and how they were being formed as good and holy and righteous people because God was poking through in that spontaneity and, and the emotions that happened. And you might be wondering, why in the world am I talking about images and, and imagining this contrast between images that show and reveal the truth of God and images that reveal the truth that we want to project sometime or the truth of the world that obviously we are a part of. And that is because we're looking at this parable of the wheat and the weeds. And the parable to me can, is a rather strange one. As we all know, parables need to be. There's a lot of things that are strange about it. We wonder why the, the servants are, are, are shrieking and surprised at their weeds. Well, you know, I just need to look over here in my garden and I see a ton of weeds. So I know as a gardener, as a home gardener, there's always gonna be weeds. And we wonder why in the world they asked the owner if he had planted good seed, because they're the ones who would have planted the seed. So there are a lot of odd things about this that we could really walk down into in some real kind of bunny holes. And like one thing that's really fascinating to me is this parable gives the idea that this force of evil is a creative power. It's not just something that's lurking around and occasionally will kind of come near us, but that the force of evil is actually something that can create, that has planted the seeds intentionally. I mean, that's a pretty remarkable thing, and that's not always our image of how evil works in the world. And so we could certainly explore that. And we could kind of go offline a little bit and think about, well, maybe we're the weeds. Maybe the weeds are actually the righteous people. And that we are being sent out into a world that does not have righteousness as a main part of it, of its essence. And we are here to choke the fruit, the bad fruit of an oppressive society. I mean, you have to think that Jesus was teaching and preaching in the middle of the Roman oppression. And so he might have been sending his disciples out to, to rip away the harvest, to use up resources that aren't going to give life then to the destruction and the abuse and the power and the status and all those things that the Roman Empire was all about. So that's something that we can explore in depth some other time. But I think what is most probably a more traditional and perhaps more fruitful way to look at this parable is to examine the, this wheat and the weeds. And we learn from this parable that they are actually to grow up next to one another. That the advice is not to rip out the weeds. Now, I find that startling because I know I, you know, if I didn't pull out the thistles over there, I would end up with a bed of thistles and I'd have a few little marigolds choking, being choked to death, trying to actually find enough resources to live. So it's actually really shocking that God, the message seems to be that God is saying no wheat and weeds grow up alongside one another. And that means we're going to rub shoulders with that which is not of God. And there can be a, actually a wonderful challenge in that. It can encourage us to speak our truth or speak God's truth ever more loudly. To know that whatever we, we proclaim about the truth and the love and the grace and the joy and the beauty of God, there's going to be some force around us that's going to negate that. And so our voice has to become strong and we have to develop the wheat in this world so that we can, can continue to flourish and push back against that which is not of God. Of course, this can also talk to us about how we as individuals may have both wheat and weeds within us. We may have that beautiful and truthful part of God inside of us. Well, I know we do. But we can have that peace within us and have that loud and clear. And we can also have another part. This seems to have bought into the world's 
values a bit more that we are about our own gain or our own financial status rather than caring for the others. I know I say this every week, but we, we always have to put these parables in the context of the Sermon on the Mount because all of this follows that centerpiece of Matthew's Gospel who says, Bless, where, where he says, blessed are the poor, blessed are the oppressed, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who weep. And so we need to understand that Part of our work is to, to, um, to rip out or to allow, not to rip out, but to allow those parts of us that aren't true of God to be shown into the light of Christ so they can be made whole and new. Like I look at this tomato. I know I posted on Facebook this week that I have seven foot tall tomato plants, which is remarkable to me. And so I was looking at the fruit the other day, marveling at this all, and I look at this, and then I look at the other side and see what I see. I have a blight. And so it's, it's something to remember that something that looks perfect or isn't yet formed, but is almost perfect and just needed to ripen, actually also contains something that is stunting its growth. And so I'm going to go off to the fungicide store, and I'm going to buy some fungicide, as Edna keeps talking to me about because I don't want to do this. I want to bear fruit. And so just because we're not to judge and just because we're not to pull out or yank out the weeds does not mean that we are not to be attentive. It does. It means that we can distinguish between faithful and sinful behavior. And we can be responsible for ourselves for being as faithful as we possibly can. It does mean that we can teach our children and our grandchildren the difference between right and wrong. It can mean that we can stay focused on mission and Christ's mission and being true in the world. And if there are people in our parish or in our community or in the world who don't value those things, then that's, so, that's okay. We can stay true and strong and real as we continue that work with God. The other piece that I find really interesting about not ripping out the weeds, which seems to be everybody's natural instinct, is something very promising and actually really hopeful. I think it says to me that God sees possibilities in all things, that even the broken, the blighted, the diseased, the destructive parts that are within us are precious to God. That God always sees the possibility for transformation. God always sees that we can strengthen the good parts so that we can hold and ultimately dismantle that which is not to bring our lives into the fullness that God desires for us. And so I find that actually really encouraging and opening. That God, there is nothing that is outside of God's reach. That all parts of us, are precious to God. And God can imagine new life within us. And that is the promise that is made true and real to us in the resurrection of Christ. So when I'm thinking about the images, you know, I've thought an awful lot about images because over the last four months, as I have been creating these online services, I've once I figured out the technology of how to actually do any of this, I've been trying to be intentional about the images that I bring forward because I want you to engage in this worship and not just watch it. And so I know the power of images and I know, I think there are images that can draw us all to the best of who we are. I think there are images that can remind us, like the images of the sunlight pouring through the altar window that can remind us of the beauty and the grace and the joy and the sense of communion that we have had and yet we have to believe will be there again for us. But I want us to think about our own images or what we are repre how we are representing ourselves in the world by the words that we say, by the actions that we take, by the images that we are posting on Facebook, whatever it is, are they revealing God? Or are they revealing the weed part of our world? How can we look for the holy within each moment? How can we, instead of taking a picture, as one of my spiritual mentors will say, how do we receive an image? Because if we receive an image, we're receiving it into our soul. So the next time you take a picture or you ask to take someone else's picture, 
I invite you to look for the soul part. I know a photographer who is excellent in doing this, that she will take all of the, the images that you would expect, the milestone images and pictures that seem like the world is yearning for, but you'll always find that little kernel of truth, the soul part. So as we talk about the wheat and the weeds, as we talk about that which is revealing of God and that which is not, let us do our part as we imagine a world together with God where we can grow and flourish and the seeds can scatter to the ends of the earth. May we be like Joan. May we in our eyes and our heart and our stance, may we reveal beauty and strength and joy and peace. May we allow our lives to reveal that which is true about God. May we open ourselves to the gift that we can offer to the world. I ask all this in the name of God. Amen. The Prayers of the People Good people of God, I bid your prayers for Christ's holy Catholic Church. May it be a beacon of peace, unity and understanding in an often conflicted, divided and confusing world. We are the body of Christ on earth. May we witness to your love. I bid your prayers for all peoples throughout the world. May we find a way to bring an end to the conflicts that surround us, that all may be safe wherever they may be. We are the body of Christ in the world. May we make peace. I bid your prayers for all in need of wholeness, especially praying for the residents of the Episcopal home. Shirley, Kathy, Sharon, Paula, and Myrtle. We pray for staff of the Episcopal Home, Ada, Alyssa, Anita, Becky, Diane, Donna, Effie, Esther, Jane, Jen, Julie, Laurie, Laurie, Sondra, Tammy, Tonya, Wayne, Mary Grace, Mike, Lewis, Kathy, Tammy, and all those who love them. We also pray for Evan, Kathleen, Amy, Ellen, Tabitha, the Williams family, Alice, Margaret, Samantha, Wanda, Brian Rotts, Brian Hellman, the Watts family and Pedro, Rachel Mooney, Lara and Brian, Stan and Dottie, and those who are grieving the loss of a loved one, Kathy, Janine, Ellen, Fred, Tom, Susan, Connor and Matthew, Blake and Catherine, and those whom we name either silently or aloud. We also pray for God's peace and protection to be upon those who are in active duty in our military. Andrew Hawkins, Kelly Williams, Levi Nelson, Tawny White, Brad Arnold, Kyle Hubert and Brent Welch. We are the body of Christ to a broken world. May we bring Christ's healing love. I bid your prayers for all those saints who have gone before, especially remember Peter Looker, who spent many years as an active member here at St Andrews, and the father of Jennifer Matson, a priest in our diocese who was raised up by our, our parish. May we strive for the fullness of your presence when our earthly time is done. 
We are the body of Christ in this time as we await our time in God's kingdom. I bid your prayers of thanksgiving for this parish of faith, especially for our ministries to the hungry in our community. May we be guided in our life at St Andrews to learn how to bring others to Christ, seek forgiveness and strive for unity and concord. We are the body of Christ to one another. May we seek and serve Christ in our neighbours. God, our hope, may your blessing empower our thanksgivings and our prayers, for we put our trust in you. Amen. In this green, growing season of Pentecost, May we continue to sow seeds of hope in our world. May we grow in our faith as we walk in the footsteps of Jesus. May our love bear fruit in the world. And may we offer our whole selves to the mission of Christ, of bringing healing and reconciliation to our world. Therefore, I ask that we walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. My friends, life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who make this earthly pilgrimage with us. So be swift to love, and make haste to do kindness, and the blessing of God, who comes to us as creative presence, saving grace, and life-giving spirit be upon you and all whom you love this day and forevermore. Amen.
Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.